I'm Peter McCulley. On this edition of Today in BC, it's our Made in BC book club featuring two authors. Adrian Rayside is the creator of the popular The Other Coast comic strip, which appears in over 200 newspapers. Besides being an editorial cartoonist for four decades, Rayside is the author of over 20 books, including The World According to Dogs and An Owner's Manual in Paradise for Cats. Paradise for Cats is sort of a companion book to Rainbow Bridge to Pet Paradise, which came out a few years ago about the loss of a pet, and it was pretty much about the loss of a dog. This young boy loses his dog. And I got the idea from looking at some of these pet loss publications, some of them quite serious and some of them quite sad, and I thought for a young kid, they don't want to be traumatized any more than they are from losing probably their best friend their entire life is a dog or a cat. So I wanted to do something that was serious, humorous, but also ended on an up note to say that, look, everything's still okay. We're also chatting with CC Chris Humphreys, playwright, actor, voiceover actor, and award-winning author. We'll talk about that and his latest book, Based on Family History. It's a fascinating story of intrigue and romance entitled, Someday I'll Find You. I've had lovers before in my stories and some quite big love stories. This one felt more centrally relevant to two people who meet on the streets of London as Hitler tries to burn London down. And they've got three days before they each go off to fight their wars to decide if this is just desire, this thing they found, or is it something more? Thanks for joining us today on the podcast, Chris. Delighted to be here, Peter. Thanks for having me. You've written more than 20 novels. A good number of those are based on actual historical events. And your latest book is based on family history, a spy, a fighter pilot. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the family business, acting. Your father, Peter, and your grandfather, Cecil, were both actors, so no pressure there, right? Yeah, that's right. It was actually even worse than that, because my mother's parents were also actors. So all four grandparents were actors. So I call it the curse in the blood rather than the family business. I think I was doomed to pursue the family line. Well, you've had a very busy career as an on-screen actor as well. Tell us about some of your favorite roles. Yes, I hate to speak of it in the past tense because I'm still hoping to start playing old coots any day now. <laughs> but when I was a younger fellow, I was living in England mainly because, as you can tell by my accent, I grew up in England, though I was born in Toronto, in fact. I did pretty well out of the gate. I got onto the stages of London straight away out of drama school. I was working in English regional theatre and I got a screen test to play a small role in some biblical Roman epic and actually walked away with one of the leads. So I ended up in Tunisia for 10 months playing Caleb, the Jewish zealot who becomes Rome's top gladiator in a biblical Roman epic called Anno Domini, which was one of the last big miniseries of the 1980s, NBC miniseries. So that was a kick and that took me to Hollywood for a bit. I didn't actually like Hollywood very much, so I came back to England, went back into theatre, then played various quite well-known British things, like I spent a year in uniform as a copper on a show called The Bill, which is a hugely popular English cop show. I was one of the coppers on that for a year, which was fun. And then, probably best known for Canadian audiences, I also did three episodes of Corrie, as we call it, or Coronation Street, <laughs> as this likely lad from London who goes up and cons the Northerners in their own patch, which was also great fun. But yeah, lots of roles. I became an actor, essentially, so I could leap around with bladed weaponry. I've done a ton of that, which was huge fun. You've obviously had a pretty busy resume as an actor. What inspired you to become a writer? It's interesting. In recent years, I've just started to find myself much more as not all three different things. But as a storyteller, I've always been a storyteller. I was the kid organizing the other kids to be in my stories of daring do and attacking castles and fighting off bandits and all that stuff. Being an actor, is, it can be great. I've had a wonderful time as an actor playing other people's stories. Because I was always making up stories in my own head, I knew I needed to start writing them. And so eventually I did. Like most people, I thought, oh, I'll never do that because I'm not a writer. But by various processes, I managed to figure out how to do it. I started as a playwright because that seemed accessible, though I always wanted to write historical fiction because that was where I lived as a kid. The more swashbuckly, the better. I read all the Dumas and the Jules Verne and all that stuff. 
the classics. And so eventually that's what I ended up writing, a more sort of highly adventurous, very charged, very driven historical thrillers is what I write, really. So as an actor, do you find that those experiences you've had on stage or on screen have influenced your writing and in what ways? Oh, undoubtedly. Most people who read my books, the first thing they say is, oh, I can see the film. I always reply, I hope you do, because I will be much wealthier if that happens. And there's always something, even my new ones, in the process of being optioned at the moment. But many are optioned and few are made, sadly. But yes, being an actor, my novels are very character driven. I let my characters tell the stories, really. That's how I write. How I plot and structure things often is through character, desire and interest and, you know, what the character in peril is what I write, really. Put them in a great deal of peril. Dialogue, again, from my acting and my theatre background, that has a huge effect. I love to move the story through in dialogue because I think it achieves all the things you want. It moves the story forward. It reveals the character You can do a lot with subtext, of course, what the character doesn't say. So I love those aspects of of being an actor and using the skills I acquired as an actor to write my fictions. Your novels often feature very strong female characters. Do you approach portraying women in historical settings different from how you would write a man in that part? And do you draw any inspiration from real historical figures? Yes and no. (laughs) Yes, I draw inspiration from historical figures. Absolutely. I love history. I love the research aspect of doing it. I was going to go to university and read history before the curse in the blood happened and acting took over. In terms of approaching the character, people are generally very flattering about my female protagonists. And I've written several novels with a female lead, including my new one, which is a dual protagonist story. I don't approach it differently. I try to find the truth of that character's background, their motivation and their experience, and then construct them like that. I never say, oh, I'm writing a woman now, so I've got to make her talk in this manner. That will emerge from who she is and who she's interacting with and what her background is. I really enjoy it. I enjoy Equal Opportunities writing. Chris, the title of your latest novel is Someday I'll Find You. The story is loosely inspired by your parents' love story, a Norwegian spy and a British fighter pilot who met and fell in love during World War II. I read somewhere that you said this story was the one that you felt that you were meant to write. Yes, I think I had to, really, because if you grow up, with that sort of background, even though, you know, you're not hearing those stories all the time, you are aware of, you're aware of them in two ways. One, you do hear some stories. My father was a storyteller. You mentioned an actor, he was also a writer. And he would, he wasn't one of the veterans who didn't talk about his experiences in war. He would talk about selected visions of those stories, i.e., you know, if it was dramatic, which it often was, since he was shot down by the Luftwaffe over to Brook at one stage. He would tell that as a sort of, oh, yes, chased home by the four Messerschmitt 109s and, and completely leaving out the sheer bloody terror of it. And the unaddressed, and this is one of the things I think I really gained from writing this novel, that's one of the reasons I had to write it, was a chance to get to know them better, even though it's not them. It's not a memoir. It's a fiction. But just reading about the experiences they had and understanding more of where they were coming from and how they approached the raising of me, really. And my father's undiagnosed PTSD would have been an element in both his life and mine, obviously. So that was, in a way, another one of the reasons I had to write the story. It wasn't just the sheer drama of it, of having a fighter pilot father and a spy mother, which is interesting in itself. But getting to know that my dad died 40 years ago, Now, of course, like many people, I kick myself that I didn't talk to him more about what was happening beneath the surface of those glory days stories. My mother only 10 years ago, but again, she was not a talker. We had to drag the stuff out of her. It was very interesting. A lot of vets I've talked to only in the last few years of their life do they seem willing to part with any information about the war. It's absolutely true. I've talked to other vets as well and heard that anecdotally from friends whose grandfathers and grandmothers are perhaps about to move on. And yes, they will start to talk about it. Can you share any interesting anecdotes or discoveries that you made while you're researching the book? Oh, so many. 
I teach creative writing sometimes now as well. And I always talk about this because people are always asking about research. And I say the research is great, obviously, and absolutely vital for getting the details right, because you make a compact with the reader that you're going to create a credible world and that they can then step into and relax into because they know you've got them, really. But the details are not quite secondary, but they're also parallel with what the research does, which is, I say, acts as a springboard for the imagination. So I find something fascinating about being a fighter pilot, flying a Spitfire. And I've got great books and great verbatim reports of what that was actually like for Canadian fighter pilots in the war. Or you find something amazing about what a spy would have actually been up to. And then you think, how would my character react in this situation? It's not just a detail. It's passing their character through those experiences. So lots of amazing things. I have my father's logbook which is RAF logbook. Every pilot was issued with one beautiful leather-bound thing. If we were on camera, I'd show you it. And in it is every single flight he took from when he volunteered six months before war broke out, because as he told me, he said, I was damned if I was going to be shot in a trench. Plus, of course, being an actor, he knew which was the better uniform, <laughs> army khaki or RAF blue. You know? But so that logbook is amazing because in his beautiful copper plate handwriting, my God, they taught people how to write in those days. He notes every flight, including the one where he was shot down and what happened and why. And, and so every flight from April the 8th, 1939 to October the 15th, 1945. And he flew all these different types of aircraft. He started as a fighter pilot, moved into transport, flew everything. So that sort of thing is gold because it's not only are you getting detail, but you're holding it. It's like this energy is contained within the pages of this book. And tell me about your mum, the Norwegian spy. My mum, yes, former Ms. Oslo. So very beautiful. She was an Oslo princess. It was officially called, she was Aryan beauty personified, you know. And the Germans very polite to her and courted her and all that stuff, which enabled her to operate, you know, under the radar pretty well. She was in Norway when the Germans invaded. Unlike Ilsa in my story, my protagonist is already in London, which is where she and Billy, the fighter pilot, meet uh, on the night of this terrible raid. So my mum was in Norway. She said first she knew of the Germans' invasion. She looked up and saw a swastika flying over the big fortress in on the Oslo Fjord, the Akatus. And her boss immediately said, hey, this can't stand. And she went, no. And so she signed up straight away. And she acted for over a year as an operative, a courier. My brother and I, my brother's a bit older than me, and he and I have done a ton of research. And we figure that mum wasn't, strictly speaking, working for the Norwegian resistance in itself, but she was almost certainly Special Operations Executive, SOE, which was the British controlled force that Churchill set up to set Europe ablaze, as he called it. That threw a different slant on it. And so in my novel, Ilsa starts in London and is being recruited by SOE and put into Oslo in deep cover. Again, different from my mum. One similarity with my mother was, and this is something that actually delayed me writing the book for this long, I think, because my aunt, who only died a few years ago at 104, would not have wanted this written about because their father, my grandfather, Carl, the writer, the actor, was a Norwegian Nazi. That, to me, was another avenue to explore, why someone makes that choice without seeking to excuse it, because my mother certainly never excused it, but to try to understand it. I'm not about black and white. And I'm much more interested in the ambiguity of people and the ambiguity of war and why people make these choices. But that was something that my mother obviously wrestled with. And Ilsa in the book actually lives with her father and simultaneously betrays him every day as a spy. Chris, I'm sitting here listening to you tell the story. And I listened to part of this book on audiobook. It's just such a natural fit for you to voice your own audiobooks. Are you having fun with that? I love it. It was funny, the very first time I did it with my first novel, The French Execution, I was in a studio in Oxford in England. I paused at the end of the first paragraph and the engineer said, Chris, are you all right? And I went, yeah, no, just give me a moment. Because I actually had this blinding revelation that I write to be read aloud by me. <laughs> and people say, oh, I can hear your voice. I can hear your voice. Yes, I do. I record my books. I record other people's books as well, which I've been making quite a lot of my living. 
it was one of those lucky things I did just before lockdown. So I did a lot of audiobook recording for people. But yes, my own stuff for sure. And I love doing it. As I say, it's my voice. I really enjoy doing it. I enjoy getting into the characters, enjoy all the different accents I have to do because this is a World War book. So there are Irish and British and Australian and Polish and Czech and Norwegian, obviously, and particularly German. Some of your novels have a historical theme, as we mentioned. There's The Great Fire of London, Bubonic Plague, and then you have, as you mentioned, the swashbuckling adventures and memorable heroes. Are there any historical figures or stories that you are thinking about writing and you've had on the back burner a little bit? Haven't had that opportunity to explore them yet? New ones, there's always. Whenever I read a piece of history and I just see the story behind it, I think, who was that character? I'd love to start researching that, which, as I say, I love and getting into that. As you noted, I've already written 22 novels, many of which are historical. There are areas I'd like to explore. I'm actually really seriously thinking about returning to the 18th century, which I love, and getting back into my Jack Absolute series. Jack was going to be my, my Bernard Cornwall Sharp or Uhtred. I was just going to keep writing him, and I was having a blast of a time when my editor suddenly decided I should veer off, and we came up with this idea of writing about Vlad the Impaler, the real Dracula, and that took me off into the medieval again, and Jack got a bit lost along the way. So I'm thinking of diving back into Jack, because I get emails all the time just going, what happened to Jack Absolute? Other than that, I've written a bit about it in one of my young adult series, but I'd like to get back to 1066 and Harold Godwinson and William the Conqueror, because my ancestors supposedly fought on both sides of that conflict. You know, the Norwegian, Scandinavian side for Harold, and Hobfrey... Chris Humphreys. Humphrey was one of William the Conqueror's barons at the battle. So maybe I should explore more family, but a long way back. <laughs> what, as an author, do you hope readers take away from your books, Chris? Enjoyment, really. I always say, especially when I'm teaching it, the most important aspect of any scene is to keep the reader reading. My stuff, I think, makes people want to keep reading it, which is good. It has a sort of propulsion to it. That said, especially with this new book, there's perhaps more layers within this one than in some of the others in that I was exploring family stuff. I was exploring that ambiguity and I was exploring love. I've had lovers before in my stories and some quite big love stories. This one felt more centrally relevant to two people who meet on the streets of London as Hitler tries to burn London down. And they've got three days before they each go off to fight their wars to decide if this is just desire, this thing they found, or is it something more? And they travel to Suffolk together in a borrowed black market petrol truck, and they get to know each other. But it's only when they actually reveal their hearts to each other, and I'm not giving too much away here, that they realize. And then they part, as so many people part. They meet, and then they go off to war, in which both of them will probably be dead quite quickly, because the life expectancy of both a fighter pilot and a spy was tiny. Will they meet again? Which is why the book's called Someday I'll Find You. When the Today in BC Made in BC book club continues, Adrian Raisai, editorial cartoonist and author. From the latest community news to informative, entertaining reads for travelers and the cannabis curious, just visit your local Black Press Media community newspaper website to sign up today. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC, where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. I'm Peter McCulley. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. Adrian Rayside is the creator of the popular The Other Coast comic strip, which appears in over 200 newspapers. Besides being an editorial cartoonist for decades, Rayside is the author of over 20 books. Thanks for joining us today, Adrian. 
Peter, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really enjoying your little studio up here with lovely views of the parking lot, but it is a very nice parking lot. All two stories. All the two stories, yes, but they're nice two stories. As you can appreciate, Siri and I do a fair amount of reading online, trying to find interesting facts about our podcast guests. And imagine my surprise when I saw the first line of your Wikipedia page, and I quote, he began drawing cartoons on washroom walls as a kid. I've seen that myself. I have no idea where it came from. It could have been from some flippant comment I made during an interview many years ago. But in actual fact, I got my start from drawing in school textbooks. I grew up in New Zealand, and we had one of these classes where every month this very delightful old elderly lady would come into the class for scripture lessons. Each kid was given a, a, like an exercise book that already had in various things from the Bible, and we were allowed to draw in it draw next to these things. So for me, it's, wow, I'm actually legally allowed to draw in a textbook. So of course I go nuts. And you'd hand in the exercise book at the end of the class, and the next month I'd get my book back with a note from the teacher saying, Adrian, I don't think they had rocket ships back then. So please see me. <laughs> so then the, the, at the end of the class, I'd hand the book in again, and then the next month the book would come back with something like, Adrian, no, really, there were no trains in the desert. Please see me. <laughs> you were historically inaccurate. I was historically <laughs> inaccurate. And I've been that way ever since, actually. <laughs> One of your first paying gigs was a cartoonist illustrating your Mother Jones children books. So I'm guessing lead and charcoal were part of your DNA? Yeah. My aunt was a very accomplished wildlife artist, so I inherited something. Although she was much more talented than I ever would be. My mother was a very accomplished playwright, children's book author, and musician. And she'd written some of these children's books, which... My father at the time had a small private press as a hobby and he printed these books. She asked if I could do some illustrations for some of them. I wasn't paid, but they were feeding me, so that's pretty good. So that was my first attempt at actually something that was more professional than doing something in school books. But my first actual paying job was in around 1977, I think it was, I'd be sending out what they're called gag cartoons, which is basically you do a bunch of rough drawings of gag cartoon and you'd package up maybe five or six that you think would be relevant to a specific publication. Maybe it's an automobile magazine. In these days there were a lot more magazines than there are now and so you'd draw up maybe five or six cartoons on cars and garages and stuff and you'd send the roughs off with a self-addressed envelope with the postage and in the hope that they'd buy one and then you'd get it back to say yes go to ink and we'll pay you. Well, after papering the wall of my bedroom <laughs> with rejection slips, normally you'd get a nice little rejection slip. But one of the funniest rejection slips I got was from, and I think it was a men's magazine, saying, congratulations, you're getting this lovely rejection slip instead of a check, <laughs> which I thought was very funny. <laughs> anyway, I sold a cartoon to a logging magazine in Washington State, and they paid me $2. And I thought, I made it. I am now a professional cartoonist. I'm on my way. Well, of course, for the next six weeks, I didn't sell anything. But little by little, I think I sold to a Duncan newspaper a bunch of gag cartoons for five bucks a piece. Sometimes the money was good, sometimes bad, but it was like inching up. And then I was hired to do a comic strip for the Toronto Star, which was a big jump. And then I'm in Toronto, I thought, well, I may as well go to New York where all the magazines are. And had pretty much every door <laughs> slammed in my face. But it was a good way to learn humility, which if you're self-employed, you either need an incredibly thick skin or actually get off on having people tell you to go away. Well, it's been 30 years you've been publishing a comic strip called The Other Coast, which features dogs, looks at life from a dog's perspective, and is popular pretty much worldwide. How did that begin? The Other Coast started as, I think I called it The Left Coast, and turned out that somebody had trademarked that in the States, so I couldn't use that. I ended up calling it The Other Coast, which was similar to The Left Coast, and it was originally all about satire of life at the time. Every now and then I'd put one of the family dogs in there. Little by little, the dogs literally took over the strip. It's like real life. If you buy a dog or rescue a dog and bring him home, within a week, he runs the house. You're subservient to them. Eventually, it just became pretty much all about dogs. And the funny thing is, Peter, is that every now and then I throw in a strip about something else. And then I'll get these complaints from people on Facebook saying, oh, where, where are the dogs? Yeah. So that's it. I can never retire the dogs. Even though the, these dogs died years ago, they get all the fan mail. Yeah. It's really funny that way. You've been typecast. Yeah, and which is okay, because I love dogs and old pets, actually. But again, try and 
at least if it's all about dogs all the time, it can be a little bit of a drag dredging up that idea, looking at that blank piece of paper at six o'clock in the morning, hoping that black ink that I push around on that white paper actually will end up looking like something that might be funny. So do you get an idea at two o'clock in the morning and hop out of bed to scratch it out? Or do you go back to sleep thinking, no, I'll remember that when I get up in the morning? I've done that so many times. And you wake up and could you think, oh, such a great idea. I can attach that idea to that lamp. If I wake up in the morning, look at the lamp, I'm sure I'll be able to. Never works. So occasionally I've scribbled it down on a pad I keep. But half the time I can't understand what I've written. And then what will happen is a month later, like, oh, I remember what that was. <laughs> I, I think with the comic strip, it's because I work six weeks ahead with a strip from, uh, from drawing to when it's actually published, the pressure isn't quite as much there as with an editorial cartoon where you're drawing in the morning to file in the afternoon for the next day's paper. It's like a comic strip is like an assembly line. Draw the strip, you send the strip to the editor in the syndicate in Los Angeles, they edit it, fix your atrocious spelling, they send it back to you to fix you send it back to them, you've already coloured it, and it goes to paginators, and then they put it in the various different pages, and then it goes to the newspapers. So it's an assembly line where you can't just say, I'm not going to work this week, because then you've got a, a one week going through the system. There's no strip. And if there's no strip to fill that page of your strip, they'll substitute another one. As a result, you'd hate to see someone else take your spot. Not that we're jealous at all. God forbid that would happen. Podcasts work the same way. So you understand exactly what it's like. <laughs> you mentioned editorial cartoons in particular, and you've been doing an editorial cartoon for the Times Colonist newspaper in Victoria for probably 40 years? I started in 79, so what's that, 44 years? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you enjoy most about creating editorial cartoons, and what's the process? It's the funny thing about an editorial cartoon is that the idea is either there or it isn't. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to make your point Obscure politician would be ideal. Make it funny or, or, or have something to say about the environment or whatever. So it's quite a big palette you have to work with, but it's tricky sometimes putting the two together or the three together. And sometimes you'll sit down, let's say it's healthcare in BC. There's so many different things that you could do on healthcare, but what's one that I haven't done up to now? You're looking for that hook. Can I connect that with alligators? Can I connect that with a broken record from the health minister always saying the same thing again and again? Okay, that would work. So then you have to work the rough up to get the design. And sometimes you'll get halfway through the cartoon, you're inking it, and you look at it and you think, this sucks. It's dead. It died. And it's the weirdest thing. A cartoon either works or it doesn't. The last thing you want is to pick up the paper the next morning and go, oh my God, was I drunk when I drew that? Because <laughs> I hope I was really drunk because it sure looks like I was. After drawing these cartoons for over 40 years, I was drawing cartoons on uh, logging, basically strip mining the forest. How This isn't a good idea. We're going to run out of timber. Overfishing. I was doing cartoons about that too. And guess what? This is exactly what's happening. It's disappointing that we're not learning the lessons. And I wasn't the only one saying this because it was in the news. But I look back on some of these older cartoons I've done like 40 years ago and think, wow, nothing's changed. And that's kind of depressing that, that we're just not learning. Who do you find funny? What do you find funny? Do you, like other cartoonists, stand-up comedians, what or who makes you laugh? I tell you, before we got on the podcast, you're making me laugh quite a bit, <laughs> talking about some of the old newspaper stories. So yes, I would add you into that list. Jim Unger, who used to do Herman, yes. was a very good friend of mine. He was very funny, very funny. He could take anything and make it funny. He retired quite early. Gary Larson, who retired too, he's funny. Ricky Gervais, the comedian, he's funny. And it's interesting when you, you see an old broadcast from a comedian, say, done 10, 15 years ago, and you think, wow, they probably couldn't say that now. And it, I've noticed that with the editorial cartoons, is there are some subjects you just, you, you wouldn't draw on anymore. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Society has moved on and we've become a little more sensitive to other people. Think about, let's say, the old Saturday Evening Post cartoons from the 60s, how many cannibal cartoons were there? People sitting around the pot with eating insurance salesmen or something, I don't know. But you couldn't do that now. And the other thing is that I'm noticing people are much more sensitive now, especially since the pandemic. The feedback during the pandemic took on a darker tone than, say, five years ago. I think people were very frustrated. They were angry and were just looking for people to blame, although I didn't bring in the pandemic, but I was doing cartoons about... I guess the, some of the stuff I was getting was pretty, wow, I'm glad they don't know where I live. But again, I put that down to people who were just frustrated and angry and didn't know where to turn. 
I don't know whether you had the same thing with readers for the newspaper? Certainly social media took a very dark tone for two or three years. It seems to be lightening up a little bit now, but you're right. People were expressing their frustration with the world. And Over the years, I'd get letters to the editor and, or letters to me, to, to the newspaper. And some of them were pretty scathing, but somebody took the time to sit down, write the letter, find an envelope, get a stamp, and mail it off. Okay, I've had my say, you can have your say. It was never that dark. But I think with social media, some can be anonymous. I think people can hide behind the fact that you don't know who they are. Before we talk about your latest books... I did want to ask you about one of the other books that you've published. you published 20 books. A book called Return to Antarctica, which was the story of your grandfather and his experience with Captain Robert Scott's Antarctica expedition in 1910. Yeah, actually I had three relatives on that expedition. My grandfather and two great uncles. That always took over the expedition, as you may say. <laughs> My grandfather was Canadian-born and two great uncles were English. And he heard about the expedition from Mawson, who'd been there on the 1901 first expedition with Shackleton. He was studying in Cambridge College at the time. And so he thought, wow, no, this is great. And he was studying physics at the time. I'll go and apply as the expedition physicist. So he turns up at Scott's office in London. And as I want to be a physicist, I want to be the physicist on the expedition. And Scott said, we already have one who turned out to be my great uncle. Oh, okay, fine. So my grandfather's leaving. And Scott said, but we are looking for glaciologists. So he said, well, yeah, I'm a glacier. I come from Canada. Yeah, I know all about glaciers. <laughs> He's never seen one in his life. <laughs> that's a thing? That's a thing, yeah. 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 <laughs> it goes to the library after that. Anyway, so that's how it all started. But I grew up listening to my grandfather speak and great uncles and my family, all the photographs and stuff from the expedition. And as I got older, I realized that the popular narrative on the expedition was rather different than what I was brought up to understand. And going into my grandfather, he left his diaries and memoirs behind and reading those and reading his letters, I realized that, wow, there's a, there's a whole side to the story that really hasn't been uh, exposed. And not necessarily because it didn't exist, was because it, a lot of these members, when they came back from the expedition in 1913, they go straight into World War One, And they just, okay, this is done, off we go. And same with my grandfather, off to war. And so that the, as a result, it, things became forgotten and the odd memoir was written and then historians over the years would then take what this memoir said and then write their version of it. And then another historian would take that book and write the version of it. And it was almost like, I think of it as taking a Xerox copy of something and then taking a copy of that Xerox and then a copy of that Xerox and a copy of a copy of a copy. It gets blurred after a while. And I wanted to do a book that was pretty much from the source rather than from basically book after book. So I ended up going to the Antarctic and the original huts are still there, still standing. And you can still smell the leather and the pony sweat. And it's like going back in time, 100, 100 years. It's very surreal. I had the contract to write the book. The book came out and it was doing quite well. And the publisher was a Canadian division of a New York publisher. And the New York publisher decided to close the Canadian division. So as a result, my book disappeared, which was disappointing. I still have some copies. But what's ironic is that my great uncle, uh, Raymond Priestley, wrote a book about the expedition when he came back in 1913 from the expedition and then 1914 off he goes to war and his publisher in 1914 I think it was called with Scott the Silver Lining had all his books ready to go to the distributor in this warehouse in London and a zeppelin flew over and dropped a bomb on it and burnt all the copies so it's okay I think I see a family trait here the story was not wanting to be told <laughs> it's so funny it's like how ironic both books disappeared I also produced a documentary on the same subject, which the Norwegians, Norwegian broadcasters broadcast. But it was, it was a good experience, and it was fun not to write in captions. Let me put it that way. Your last three books have been about pets. So tell us about The World According to Dogs, an owner's manual. I wish I had have read this before I got a dog. It would appear that dogs have a sense of humor when it comes to their owners. I want to do a book from a dog's point of view, because there's so many books. You go into the bookstore, and there's like shelves of how to look after your pet and how to train your pet. And Look, dogs train us. We've never trained a dog. <laughs> they pretend to be trained. So I wanted an owner's manual from the dog's perspective. I'd had this idea for a number of years, and I fiddled with it backwards and forwards, and my publisher, Harbour Publishing, said, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. And then all of a sudden I had to realize, oh, no, I've got to finish this. It was only half done. So I had to scramble with the deadline I had. But it came out well. The funniest thing was, the hardest part of that book is 
not all the different things that, for example, dogs pooping is, is a dark art. Anyone that's had a dog knows that a dog is only going to go where he wants to go. And it doesn't matter what you say to him, this area is not right. That's to, no, no, i got to go here, i got to go there. They'll pick a spot that's actually the most embarrassing for you in front of a restaurant or in front of your neighbor or on your neighbor's lawn. So th- things like that, that are explaining this is what dogs do from a dog's perspective. And this may sound weird, but the front cover has a dog writing on a crayon, an owner's manual. To try and make the dog hold a crayon, to make it look like he's holding a crayon, when a dog can't hold a crayon, do you know how that difficult that is? <laughs> so I drove the designer insane day after day. No, this isn't right. i got to change it. No, that's not right. Make it bigger, make it smaller. Drove the poor guy nuts. But it was fun, fun to do the book, and uh, it's doing okay. But again, it was one of those things that it was a germ of an idea that took a long time for it to come to fruition. And sometimes that's a good thing, because if you do something too quickly, you look back on it and think, why didn't I fix that? Or, why did I miss that? And it happens all the time with an editorial cartoon, because you don't have the lead time. So with dogs, I had a couple of years just to fiddle with it. So it worked out okay. Your latest book, Paradise for Cats, A Return to Rainbow Bridge, is a special children's story that will help comfort children as they deal with the loss of a pet. Something that those of us who have had pets knows that can be very emotional. Paradise for Cats is sort of a companion book to the Rainbow Bridge to Pet Paradise, which came out a few years ago about the loss of a pet. And it was pretty much about the loss of a dog. This young boy loses his dog. And I got the idea from looking at some of these pet loss publications some of them quite serious and some of them quite sad. And I thought, for a young kid, they don't want to be traumatized any more than they are from losing probably their best friend their entire life is a dog or a cat. So I wanted to do something that was serious, humorous, but also ended on an up note to say that, look, everything's still okay. Your dog or your cat has gone on to the Rainbow Bridge where he's happy and he's doing all the things that, that he's always wanted to do with his friends. And you know what? There'll be more pets. You've got a whole life ahead of you. So I did this book written basically for kids. The amazing thing is that it's adults who are buying it and adults who are writing, thanking me for the book for, because of pets they'd lost. So it never occurred to me that it would be something that universal. But it was a difficult book to write because I was inspired to actually finish it and really dig into it after our dogs died. And they're in the book, obviously. I'm grieving too at the same time. And it was one of those things that you also wanted to make it so that it's light enough that it can be read to a kid at night without giving them nightmares. That was the other tricky tricky part to, to navigate with the book. I enjoyed your sense of humor in the book, Wildlife for Idiots, or perhaps it's the animal's sense of humor and not your sense of humor. I think animals have a sense of humor. They have to. They're not that different from us. They love, they have children, they nurture them, they squabble. We see eagles around here squabbling all the time. What they're fighting over, I have no idea. Somebody missed a fish and the other one, who knows? It's really a compilation of the animals in the other coast strip over the years. And it's really my idea of showing that animals are actually smarter than us. Wildlife for Idiots is basically the cover is a safari jeep with all these people with their cameras. And it's in Africa and they're driving along with their cameras. And there's a lion and there's a hippopotamus and a zebra and baboon. And they all have name tags. Hello, lion. Hello, (laughs) hippopotamus. Just to show, you know what, They're, they're smarter than us. I have a lot of fun with animals because I feel that... They're not just sentient beings. They have lives. They have thoughts. For example, what would an alligator with anger issues do if his psychologist came in wearing alligator skin boots? Would a coyote be served in a wolf bar? Anthropomorphizing, I guess, is the word animals, which I think is actually very close to the way they are. Just because they have feathers and scales and webbed feet doesn't mean to say that they're not similar to us in what they like and what they don't like. Adrian, what makes a better pet? Cats or dogs? Have you decided? Oh, you're going to get me in trouble here, aren't you? This gonna, is it. This I'm going to try. You're, you're going to finish my career is what you're going to do. Boy, I thought the Freedom Truckers didn't like me. I'm going to be so careful what I say here. Dogs are wonderful pets because they're all over you and they love you. It doesn't matter what you do. And cats are wonderful pets too. They don't judge you. And I think they all have their own distinct personalities. And somebody who has a cat, they want it for the personality of a cat. They're quiet, calm great lap animals and not so good on the beach, maybe not so good on the front seat of the car. And dogs, of course, are rambunctious and on you all the time. And maybe that's what you want. If somebody's an 85-year-old lady, probably doesn't want to have a German Shepherd in their condo. 
that's probably a little much. I think cat would be ideal. Then again, somebody who goes surfing and hiking and hang gliding probably wouldn't want a cat. So it's really up to the individual. Did I skate through that one okay? Thanks to Adrian Rayside and Chris Humphreys for being with us on this edition of Today in BC's Made in BC Book Club. If you have suggestions or comments, send a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may be part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts.